So um, let's get right to it. I didn't know I was interviewing John. I thought I just had to sit up here and look pretty and maybe answer a few questions. But they said, no, no, you're interviewing him. So I've been trying to do my research so I sound smart. Let's see how I do. <laughs> so um, John Ridley is one of those guys who can do anything and can do it all and has done it all. He is a novelist, screenwriter, producer, director, editor. His film resume spans from Undercover Brother to 12 Years a Slave, for which he won an Oscar, to, uh, that's right, the remake of Ben-Hur. And, and that's not even touching the stuff we're gonna talk about tonight. So I think it's safe to say that uh, John Ridley is ruining the curve for the rest of us and that he is annoying. <laughs> so he's been called one of the most interesting filmmakers of our time. He has been called one of the great voices of our generation. I call him he who must be obeyed. He has had a very, very busy year this year. He wrote and directed a six-part miniseries called Gorilla about radicals in 1971 London. And while he was filming in London, the third season of American Crime, which he also created, was in production in Los Angeles. And what that meant was a lot of actors were walking around the set going, where's John, where's John? And at the same time, he was also finishing up a two-hour documentary about the 25th anniversary of the LA riots called Let It Fall, which he wrote, directed, and edited. And um, those are the projects we're gonna be talking about tonight. They, they traverse history, they traverse cultures, they traverse continents. Um, they address challenging, thought-provoking, potentially um, divisive subjects, immigration, sex trafficking, slavery, race relations today and yesterday. And um, they were also really freaking good. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome John Ridley onto the stage. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. Thank you for welcoming us here this evening. I appreciate it. How are you? I'm really well. Welcome to Aspen. It's Thank a, you. It's a thrill to have you here. An honor to, um, an honor to be uh, working with you. And I think enough about John Ridley. Let's talk about me. So, what's the most special thing about me? <laughs> Can I tell you one of the most special things no, about no, Felicity? I'm well, I'm not because I think people should know. One of the most special things about Felicity. Um, you're probably, you know, I mean, one of the most accomplished actors, not just actress, actors working, you know, Golden Globe, Emmy, Oscar nomination, all these things. Felicity didn't know me. Um, well, go ahead, please applaud. She much deserves it. So three years ago, you know, four years ago, whatever perception people might have of me now certainly didn't exist. I mean, just four years ago, which is, it's, Hard for me to believe it's been that fast. But um, among those people who did not know me, certainly Felicity did not. And um, she was sent a script for a very, I think, uh, at that time, very unusual show, American Crime. And not just that, a very unusual character, Barb Hanlon, which if you have not seen the first season of American Crime, and you should for no other reason to see Felicity's performance, Barb is um, a person, I think, on the surface that... Um, I think at, at a space like this at an Ideas Fest where people, I would think, come here where they're open-minded, um, probably would consider yourselves to be progressive, and at least would want to interact with people. Maybe don't agree with everybody about everything, but at least challenge yourselves to agree with that. I think Barb was the opposite of that. And um, not only the opposite of that, I think in traditionally in television and film, most actors, and for good reason, would want to see that moment on screen where you know, they, they may say ugly things, but they're out walking the street in the rain and they see a puppy and they pick him up and the audience knows, okay, inside they're a really good person. Um, Barb had none of that um, and displayed none of that. And for an actor to get a script from, I think at that point, 
you know, people had not seen 12 Years, they had not seen All This By My Side, a film I did about Jimi Hendrix. To get that kind of a script and to get it from someone that they might not be aware of, and particularly a person of color, and look at the script and go, okay, so am I representing every white person in America, and this is about, you know, retribution or uh, reprimands or things like that? And it's like, no, everybody in this show is going to have their moments of being challenged, but to, to get a script like that, did a character like that, um, and we only had a week to work together before we shot the pilot because I couldn't talk to Felicity. I literally couldn't talk to her. She was under a deal at another company, so we couldn't technically speak to each other. Um, we met once in the morning, and I had to get on a plane and fly to Austin. So the next the time, morning after he won the Academy Award. Um, so we met very briefly, and. I had to leave, and the next time we saw each other, I think it was about four days later, and we had a couple of days of rehearsal with uh, Tim Hutton, and uh, we rehearsed the scene that was very challenging, and you know, just the way you leapt into that and went into that and didn't look back and didn't say, okay, well, I want first episode is cool, second episode is cool, but third episode, I really need to see a puppy by the side of the road. Um, to do that and then to walk out of all that with a well-deserved Emmy nomination, I think, that is the reason um, you're so spectacular, among many, many reasons. I wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for you. you know, Tim Hutton, Regina King, um, Lily Taylor, all these people who were well above my station, who looked at the script, I don't think looked at me, but looked at that script and said, this is a subject matter that's worth engaging in. Um, that's what it was all about, so thank you. Well, it was an honor. Um, that, was, that wasn't supposed to happen. But anyway, um, we have clips of the three projects that I mentioned. But before we go into the clips, I just wanted to ask you some broad-ranging questions. Sure. And the first one is, it's been said that there are no, <laughs> don't laugh at me already. Um, it's been said that there are no easy answers in a John Ridley project. You know, so there are no, why is that? Who, who said this? Is what I <laughs> that guy. Okay. okay, I believe that. I believe, you know, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> that there are no easy answers in a John Ridley project. And I, I've experienced that in American crime, that there's no real hero, there's no real bad guy. It feels like the tables turn at a moment where you go, oh, well, he's the asshole. Then in an episode later, you go, oh, he's not. I, I think, well, first of all, I don't know, you know, again, four years later, it, I think it's very nice of you to say that there's a John Ridley type project. I think there are like four things that I've done, and that sort of constitutes the, the body of work. But I, I don't think, I would say they're not only, if this is true, I would say they're, they're not only not any easy answers. For me, it's very important they're not any answers at all. Um, I, and this is for me personally, there's all kinds of, entertainment or all kinds of things out there that's put into the public space and they all have their own value. But for me personally, um, I disengage at that point where the writer in particular um, tries to answer very difficult things for the audience. I mean, there are very brilliant people in the world, far smarter than I'll ever be, who don't have answers for the issues that we faced. And if there was one piece of entertainment or a book or a film or a piece of art that was really going to change the world, somebody would have written it or drawn it or done it by now. So for me, um, I'm, I'm less interested in answering questions than posing them. And in particular, I think if you look at the three seasons of American Crime, particularly when you get to the end of them, and I don't mean to spoil anything for anybody who may not have seen them yet, um, but we go out of our way to avoid uh, resolving the stories uh, and leaving them in a space where the audience, you're, you can get that moment where the audience is kind of preparing. You know, I sat with you for eight episodes or 10 episodes, here we go, and we just, we're gone. We get out before we arrive. Um, and, and people, one person in particular said to me about the second series, they got to the end and they said, oh, I really wish that you'd had a happy ending. <laughs> and I said to them, but the way it ended, if you want a happy ending, then it's right there for you. You know, it's not up to me to write that happy ending for the audience the same way it's not up to me to, um, or any one person, to go out and solve the ills of society. 
Um, we have to do that. We have to accomplish those things. And I think for me personally speaking, there's nothing less satisfying than an ending that is so complete it leaves no space for the imagination, as opposed to an ending where all the pieces are there, but the audience has the opportunity to construct the ending that would have been most satisfying to them. Or to walk away and go, well, you know, I thought this, and somebody else goes, no, why would you think that? Because clearly this happened. So um, I don't think there are any answers, and I think if there is an answer in the work that I do, then I've probably made a mistake somewhere along the way. I love that. Um, given that you're a writer, director, producer, czar, um, and you are meticulously involved in every step of the way, could you, well, you are, I mean, everyone, every single thing, could you um, walk us through the transition that goes from they go, okay, here's a project, or what do you want to do, from the idea, from the inception, to the actual, you know, manifestation of it, the execution? Yeah, it, it's such a, for, for anyone who's not really been involved in the process, and not just being creative, hopefully being creative, but a process where you're being creative with other people's money and, and their real estate. When I say real estate, I'm talking about, um, you know, the television, whether it's streaming, whether it's cable, um, because you're, you're, you're walking a fine line between trying to create something that you feel has value and value to yourself and something that has value to an audience, but then has some kind of very crassly monetary value to these people who are investing in the work that you do. And that's something that I think you have to take into consideration. I think when I was a younger person, I didn't take it into consideration because you're young and you're like, ah, I don't care. You gave me the money. I'll do whatever I want. Um, and then you, you get older and you realize, you know, that somebody is investing and you do have to be uh, cognizant of that and responsible in some kind of way. And I think with American crime, we've been very responsible just and we come in on time under budget. You know, sometimes it's that responsibility where it's like, hey, we were good partners. You may not love the work. But then it is being aware of, um, for example, with American crime, originally ABC, Michael McDonald, who you know very well, most of you may not know Michael McDonald, not the singer, but he's a producer on the show, was very instrumental in bringing me on board. American crime originally was not my idea. Um, ABC wanted to do, it was in the wake of the um, Trayvon Martin trial, more specifically the trial of George Zimmerman for murdering Trayvon Martin. And this trial was, for a moment, you know, one of the most galvanizing moments in American, uh, in the legal process. Unfortunately, you know, that moment comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes. But at that time, ABC wanted to do a TV show about uh, a quote-unquote trial of the century. Very similar to that in the sense that we have these trials and for folks um, they are very important and then they move on and there's another trial that's very important for whatever reason and, and we move on. We compartmentalize it and we move on. Um, and it sounded interesting but I felt that a, a TV show that's just about a trial, it misses the really important aspect and that's the people who are involved. Um, the families of the victims, the families of the accused, the victims themselves if they survive the tragedy, the communities. And most importantly, how we as people, um, maybe more so, uh, maybe just seems more so as you get older, but how we as people take a rooting interest in the outcome of the trial, not necessarily in the justice, but in our politics, and how we would like to see that happen, irrespective of uh, the facts or what's introduced. And we see that all the time. Uh, and I thought that would be a more interesting show that it's less about the police, it's less about uh, the judiciary, it's less about those people who we hope and believe are objective coming in. But for the victim, uh, the families of the victims, we want some, they would want something else from the legal system. Um, the families of um, those who've been victimized want something else. So I thought a show like that, where you see the cascade effect through communities, through people, that would be a very interesting show and they thought it would be very interesting as well. So originally American Crime, it was meant to be a limited series which is just, you know, one and done. Like in the old days, like Rich Man, Poor Man or Winds of War, Roots, things like that where you come, you do something and you leave. Um, I honestly never thought it would get on television just because for a broadcast network to do a show where the lead character, like Barb Hanlon, um, to me, is an individual that you don't necessarily root for. You, you see the empathy and you see 
um, a phrase that you use all the time, which I think is very interesting, that she's mission specific, that she wants justice for her son. And I think families, most families can see that. Hey, if that were my kid, I'd want that as well. But there are a lot of elements to Barb where you go, okay, but I, I hope I would try to achieve that in a different way. Her husband, her ex-husband, played by Tim Hutton, it was by all accounts a, a terrible dad, not even a dad who, who tried to do well but failed. I mean, this was a guy who didn't even try and was um, uh, just, had completely lost touch with his family, had been estranged from his kids, um, lost everything through a gambling addiction, um, and now wanted to try to be a stand-up father, but it was far too late. Uh, Regina's character, a very devout Muslim American, who, you know, I, three years ago I was surprised that we could get a, a, a Muslim American character who spoke their mind, who stood up for what they believed in, and was well-rounded on television. You know, three years later, I don't think, unfortunately, I, I never realized how, um, you know, how singular that character would be. And I will say I was amazed in, in the best possible way. You know, Regina not only was nominated for an Emmy, but won an Emmy for that character, which was amazing. But on the surface, there were just a collection of characters that you would think that a broadcast network in particular would, would not want to see that constellation of individuals on television. Um, and I think we all went into the pilot feeling like we were giving it our best effort, but that it probably was not going to get on the air. And to get that show from the script stage to the pilot order, from the pilot order to production, to production, to order, and then have it ordered for a second season and then a third season in the way that your peers, our peers, um, recognize that show was pretty stunning. So getting from that position of just pitching the show you know, on the air, it is about having a partnership, a partnership with the network, a partnership with the studio, a partnership with the actors, and really having a communication and making sure those scripts are in on time and making sure that everybody knows what's happening so that everybody feels fully invested and there's not that sense of, okay, what are we doing this week and what is this about and where is this character going? I think there are a lot of things that the actors, you know, we, we kept from the actors because we wanted an immediacy to everything that was happening, but in the process, there was no, there was never a time where um, production, uh, the production heads, people in wardrobe, costume, production design didn't know exactly what we were doing. That's how you come in on time under budget and that's how you get a network that goes, okay, in the balance of things, this show works for us. We'd love to give you another season, a few seasons. It turned out very nicely. It did. Let me ask you about risks. Because in that moment when you do the pilot and you go, well, I don't think it's going to go past the pilot. I mean, you take risks in everything you do, not just in the stories that you choose to tell, but in how you, choose, how you tell those stories. So how do you have the courage to do that? At that moment when they go, you could do this pilot, it's not going to get picked up. How do, you not, how do you not sort of go to the siren song of projects that would be less challenging and more crowd-pleasing? How do you go about your risk taking, or does it feel like risk taking to you? I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm 52 years old, and most of my stuff has failed. So it's there's, <laughs> you know, it's not like at this point, you know, even in that failure though, the, the basic things, you know, I've been able to raise a family and pay the bills and put food on the table. So at this point, you know, popularity has its place. I don't want to say like, oh, gee, I don't, I don't want to be popular. That's for, you know, that's that's for. The hacks. I, I wish I had a show that was, you know, so immensely popular that it took the pressure off. But at the same time, the things that I've done, you know, the, the reason that I'm, I'm even here is that I've done these things that people may not know them, but the people who do know them feel that there was a certain quality in it. And I, I don't think, you know, if there wasn't a quality on the page, I don't think I could have attracted someone of your stature, Tim Hutton's, Regina. I mean, you guys have been doing this a long time. You have a lot of options. So I think you got to start with a space of saying, I don't know whether it's going to be popular or not, but is it good right here, right now for the people who are looking at it? And if it's good on the page, can I sit down with you and have an intelligent conversation? And then the acting's going to be good. And the production design is going to be the good. The direction is going to be good. So it's all going to be good. And then whether somebody else likes it or not, or somebody sees a value, or whether it's populist, you know, that's beyond your control. 
There's a lot of things out there that it may not be for me, and people love it, and they go crazy, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you come home at the end of the day um, to sit down and go, wow, that's, that's entertaining. There, there's, you know, it's Sullivan's Travels. You know, you, you shouldn't have to go to a, a, a prison camp and be a yardie to realize that pure laughter is okay. Um, by the same token, you see folks trying to do something, I want to do this, and it's engineered to be popular, and it ends up in the remainder bin because people can smell it. You, you program that for me and for her and for him, and you know, we know it, and we don't like it because we're offended. So I think you've got to go with the thing that you, you know, you, you have to dance with the partner that, that got you there, and the partner that got me there is that, well, I like it, you know, that's it. Yeah. Um, I, I heard you say, if you don't like the stories being told, put down Twitter and pick up Final Draft. And I wanted to ask, were you speaking to people who feel underrepresented in film and television, or were you speaking to everyone? I mean, I love that. You guys know Final Draft is the thing that you write scripts on? It's a, it's a I'm script saying that writing. for my sister who didn't know that. <laughs> but now you do. I'm saying it to everybody. I mean, look, I'm, I'm saying it to anyone who, you know, we live in an environment now, and I don't want to get down on, on social media, but it's been it's become so easy to respond, and not only so easy to respond, but you know these unfiltered responses. And you see every day where somebody's got to walk back something, and we all say you know, dumb or inappropriate things constantly, but there's a difference between sometimes saying them in a group and sometimes even saying them accidentally in public, but those unforced errors where there's something that's happening over here and you're watching, and you feel like, well, I need to go get up and stand and go over here and insert my opinion that is completely incorrect. And that, to me, is where it's like, well, OK, I'm sitting over here and we're at a dinner party and I say something stupid and I have to call folks later and go, look, I'm really sorry about that. That's one thing. And it's another thing where there's a dinner party down the block and you're going, well, let me walk down the block, around the corner, up the stairs, into this party, and say something stupid and then walk back and go to my house. So my thing is to, to really to two groups, to anybody who's unsatisfied and thinks the answer is in any social media, um, you know, look, I mean this very sincerely. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So if I can put TV shows on the air, you know, there's nobody in here, anywhere, in Aspen or anywhere around the world who can't do it. So, you know, if you're dissatisfied, then just do this. Um, but also, and I will say this very broadly, because there is, and I don't want to get too, you know, um, Do preachy. It. No, I don't, because I want to be very sincere. But there's, there's, at the age of 52, there gets to be a point where particularly people look at your work, and very unfortunately, and for no good reason, you know, women, people of color, traditionally disenfranchised, were still completely underrepresented in media. So when you do things, you know, you sit around, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, they do carry more weight in space. And there's an expectation to be all things to all people. You know, there, there's a space, honestly, if you're a straight white guy of a certain age, you can just kind of do stuff, and that's, that's great. There's no problem with that. If you're a lesbian black woman and you do something, you know, there's going to be an expectation of, well, you need to represent certain things. And that's hard for that person. It's hard for any individual to try to represent all things to all people. You're just trying to tell a story that reflects the world in some way. And there has been a space now where people want to weigh in about that story, about that story. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And rather than getting on that person, anybody, because they didn't manage to take, you know, two hours or one book, or eight episodes, and do all things, you know, look at it and go, great, that person did that, well now I'm gonna go, I, I didn't see what I wanted to see, rather than tweet about it, I'm gonna go do something, I'm gonna go write a story, a book, paint a picture, um, photograph things. Again, it's just more that space of, um, we all can't do all things, and when you start to make fine points of, well, Felicity, you're a woman of a certain age, you should have done that. But it's like, well, why aren't you just doing what you want to do or reflecting what you want to see 
and if other people aren't satisfied, you know, then that, that's okay. I wasn't satisfied with the things that I was seeing. I wasn't satisfied. So I started writing. I started doing things. I was very dissatisfied that nobody made a movie about Jimi Hendrix the way that I would make that. And people kept saying, well, you can't do it. You don't have rights to the music. You don't have rights. I said, well, why, what does that matter? You know, I, I, why would that, you know, there, there are all these songs that he did prior to the songs that most people are aware of that are out there and available and were blues. Most people don't know that he started doing blues or rock or folk or all these things. So to me, it was people say, we well, can't do it. And I said, well, no, you can't do it. I can do it. So I'm going to go do it. And that's, I think, the philosophy people need to take is that you all, everybody, can do anything that you want to do. It's other folks who are impeding you from accomplishing the things that you want to accomplish. And I think social media and things like that, they're more an impediment because you feel like, oh, I got it out. Well, you, you got it out, but, you know, it just got buried under the next tweet, the next post. Go do something with a bit more substance. Um, and I say that with encouragement. Um, let me... Let me ask one more question before we get to, Ameri to the, a clip um, of American Crime, which is how much do you and Michael McDonald, who produced American Crime and Gorilla, which we're going to look at, how much do you make an effort to put minorities in front of and behind the camera? I mean, I know this answer because I worked on American Crime, but you say it. Um, you know, technically speaking, we, uh, <laughs> we, don't, we don't put any minorities into American Crime anywhere. Um, we put the majority um, into American crime. So women are in the majority in this country. The majority of our directors have been female. Um, people of color are the majority in this country around the world. The majority of our um, writers, the majority of our producers, the majority of people in critical decision-making positions have been women, people of color, people of, I don't want to say other orientations, but orientations that might not be mine. Um, and I give a lot of credit to Michael McDonald, and I think, uh, you know, the fact that most people, unfortunately, and I say most people, not necessarily people in the world, but people in show business don't know the efforts that Michael McDonald went to to make sure that he was putting um, really qualified, talented, interesting, um, thoughtful candidates in front of me who happen to be women or happen to be people of color or happen to be of other backgrounds. Um, every year in Hollywood, you know, all of the, the guilds, they put out reports about um, how we're doing in terms of being reflective. And I think I like to use the word, you know, reflective instead of diversity. I think diversity was something we tried to do in the 70s. Um, I think what we need to do is try to be reflective of the world we live in. And when we talk about being reflective, you know, everything changes. You know, if we try to reflect this room, you know, just the numbers change, what we do changes. And Michael really went out of his way to find individuals and put them in front of me because I don't necessarily have the time to read every script, look at every film, look at every episode of television. And um, the writers we had, the directors we had, uh, to say that they were great is an understatement. You know, they elevated this show. And to do a first season show, you know, people, again, would say things like, well, broadcast, can't do shows the way cable or streaming does them. To arrive to a place in our first season where people looked at this show and said it's as good as any other show that's out there, you can't be that good if you don't have people of ability. And you can't have stories that are about communities, that are about different environments, that are about different kinds of people if you don't represent that in your writer's room with your directors, your producers, um, in editorial. Um, so we, we just want to be reflective of the environment that we live in. And when you do that, um, you, you, you do end up with stories that touch people in a different way, that explore things in different ways. You know, I'm still just one person. And I may be outside of the prevailing culture, but I'm just one guy. And I still grew up in a prevailing culture. So there's so many things that I see or believe, they're, they're from a certain perspective. And that needs to be put out of order sometimes, all the time, it really does. And that happens when you invite people in who are qualified, who can do the job, um, and, and quite frankly, sometimes they're a little hungrier, a little hungrier. When, um, when I first read the pilot for American Crime, I thought two things. I thought, one, this is brilliant, and two, there's no way that ABC will touch this motherfucker. Um, so 
you know, it's an anthology series every year. It's, it covers something completely different. And I do want to move on to Gorilla, but I wanted to ask you, how did you choose the subject matter for season three? Well, it's interesting because people have seen the season and they've, they've said to us, oh, my God, how did you know that, you know, people would be talking so much about immigration and about authorization and things like that this year? You know, we started working on this more than a year ago. And it's really just there are conversations that are out there. There are things that people are talking about. And if you listen enough, I mean, look, immigration is not a, a new issue and how it's being used in my opinion, as a wedge issue, that's not new, but there are always these cycles. And if you listen and you talk to people, if you listen more than you talk, if you open your heart, if you sort of you know, shut down your opinions, these stories, you know, they're, they're out there. And when we were doing American Crime in the first season, it was after Trayvon Martin, when we're shooting, the, when we're filming it, um, it was in the middle of what was going on in Ferguson when we were airing. Um, the unrest in Baltimore was happening, and people kept saying, well, how did you know, how did you know? Um, it's not that we knew, these things are happening. They're constantly happening. And if you shine a light on it, um, people will see, but the, the problem is, you know, these, these shows, conversations, whatever, they come and they go, the issues don't, they don't get resolved, unfortunately. Um. I guess the, I, I do want to move on because we're running out of time, but finally, um, this is an important question. I wanted to ask, um, is there any way for you to arrange that I get an Emmy nomination? <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, okay. You know, if the universe <laughs> is correct and does the things that they do. I mean, look, I will say this, the, what, what you've done, oh what my God, you're taking Regina, me what everybody has done, it's very hard for me because, you know, I've been blessed with everything that this business can give you. But, you know, what you've done, what Regina has done, what Tim has done, what Lily has done, you know, you're like a parent at some point. I feel like a parent. And there's really no reward that's enough. Um, I hope your peers recognize what you did. Um, I know that there's no balance to these things. But um, I think more importantly, um, these folks, you know, people, the things they say about, oh my god, I've never seen Felicity like that amazing. And that's three seasons in a row. So I hope you get rewarded. I wish I could control those things, but I think people recognize um, what you do. And I think sometimes, you know, people, they say, oh my God, so-and-so got snubbed or they should have won. My feeling is you got to be in that game for people to even say you got snubbed. Because I've been doing this a long time. Nobody said John got snubbed. There was... <laughs> Many years, my name never got brought up in that conversation. So um, there's, you know, winning, there's getting nominated, and there's that space where people go, oh, Felicity, you should have had that. So at the very least, I know you'll have one of those three positions this year. That I can guarantee you. Oh, my gosh. Let's, um, <laughs> let's move on to Gorilla. Um, could you set up this clip so for the audience? Yeah, I'm not, actually, I'm not even sure. Oh, this clip... Oh, I'm not sure. It's Babu she... and Frida. Um, they're out in the middle of nowhere. So this is, yes. Yeah, so what Gorilla is about is, you know, I'm a child of the 70s and growing up with the iconography of the black power struggle, um, you know, people like uh, Angela Davis, you know, George Jackson, obviously the Black Panther Party, you're a young kid and it's just so palpable what they, what they visually represent. Um, and then you get a little bit older and you learn about consequences and consequences of their actions. And the things that they were striving for, you know, in my opinion, were absolutely correct. But you learn about things like the Marin County Courthouse shooting. You learn about the Hiberia bank robbery. Um, you learn about, again, the consequences of the actions. And you, and you start to think about what is the cost of achieving the things that we want to achieve. Um, when I say we, you know, people who are involved in a struggle. And you can look at that in any time period, the difference between a, a, a freedom fighter and a terrorist, the difference between a revolutionary and a reactionary. Um, and that's what Guerrilla is about. And originally it was set in the Bay Area uh, in the 1970s. And through an odd set of circumstances, it ended up being set in London in the 1970s. And the parallels and the timely and the timeless qualities of the story are absolutely remarkable. Um, but the scene, the clip you're going to see right now is um, uh, Babu Cisse, who's an amazing young actor, and after I cast him, no, through no 
nothing that I obviously have control over. This guy, you know, came out of nowhere, was doing our show and got nominated for a BAFTA for another show, which is sort of the equivalent of an Emmy. And so, like, this guy's just taken off. He's amazing. And Frida Pinto, I think most of you know, is absolutely amazing from, you know, Slumdog Millionaire um, through, through Gorilla. You know, this is a young lady who is just, everything about her is, is truly just star quality and her ability and her acting and her charisma. But they play a young couple who are, by all measures, very middle class in their aspirations. Um, he's a school teacher. She's a nurse. But they realize that their struggles in London in 1970, again, a lot of it deals with immigration. There was an Immigration Act in 1971 that was basically going to divide people through a lot of legalese. But what it came down to is, um, are you white or are you a person of color? And that's how you could either stay in the country or if you were coming from a close colonial nation, potentially be kicked out. This is true. Most people don't know about it. Most people don't know about the what was called the Black Power Movement in London at that time. And black at that time was a catch-all, not just for blacks or Caribbean blacks or Afro-Caribbeans, but people of Indian heritage, um, Asian heritage, Eurasian. Um, but this is a couple now who has formed an underground cell and um, taken uh, direct political action. And like a lot of people at that time period, they have a lot of philosophy, but they really don't understand the consequences of their action. And so this is episode two is what you're going to see. But this young couple that um, accidentally, uh, accidentally on purpose, has taken on some cultural density, some public density, but they don't know what they're doing. And the public thinks that they're a couple of badasses. But you have this quiet moment where they kind of got to reconcile the fact that they don't know what to do what next. And they've taken on some partners and they've taken on some other revolutionaries. Um, but they don't know what they're doing. So that's what this clip is about, where they're having an honest moment with each other about um, what they're going to do next, and in particular how Frida realizes she's being perceived in yet another male-dominated space. Um, let's move on to our final discussion of the evening, which is your documentary, um, Let It Fall. Um, and for those of you in the audience who haven't seen it, and you should see it, it's just mind-blowingly brilliant. Um, would you give us an introduction and set the scene? And I also wanted to ask you, at yeah. one point, you were working on trying to tell the story um, of the LA riots as fiction, and why revisit that as a documentary? Well, this first of all, Let It Fall is about the LA uprising 25 years ago. This year is the 25th anniversary, and for those of you in the the weird thing is, you know, there, it, there are people who, you know, who may not have been born 25 years ago. This is a quarter of a century. This is now real history. But um, again, timely and timeless. But it, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Rodney King who was um, driving, and he was driving much in excess of the speed limit in the foothill area of Los Angeles. Was pulled over by um, a couple of highway patrol officers. And then the LAPD took over the arrest. It was caught on videotape. Again, this was 25 years ago, so in an era where seeing things and seeing them instantly was just not the norm um, in an environment like Los Angeles at that time where many people in certain communities looked at the police not as protectors but as occupiers. Um, Rodney King was struck about 56 times with a PR-24, which is a metal baton. These are not wood batons. Um, these are metal batons, 56 times by four different officers, three different officers, um, in about 80 seconds. And this was captured on videotape. Uh, it was aired uh, on television a few days later, and it really changed um, the course of how people, the larger body of people looked at uh, LA and police and their interactions with the citizenry. But it's a bigger story than one night and one community and one incident. Um, it could go back. In Let It Fall, we tell the story of Los Angeles from 1982 to 1992. And many different communities, black, white, Hispanic, um, uh, the police, uh, Asian American communities, and the different plates you know, much like plates in California that are constantly moving against each other, um, time is reductive. And a lot of people look back at the LA and what they call the LA riots and say, well, it was about Rodney King being beaten. And they remember the very horrific videotape of a man by the name of Reginald Denny 
who was pulled out of his truck as he was driving through South Central and was beaten by um, what can only be called a gang of individuals um, in the streets. And people look at, well, what happened to Rodney King was horrible, but what happened to Reginald Vinnie was horrible, and that was that, and we can move on. Um, what was leading up to the LA uprising, you could at least go back 10 years. There's an argument to go back many more years. But it was very important in this story to not make it about one night, one person, one community, to make it black versus white, to be binary about race. I think we still look at race in America as binary. It's black and white, and, and that's all there is to it. To not um, indict or exonerate the LAPD, but to say that it is complicated. Again, going back to the original question, that it's not about answering things and saying, you know, here's what happened that night and here's what you should believe, uh, but seeing the complications. So 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago, Spike Lee, um, when I was still just a writer, and, and I don't even know if I was a particularly good one, but invited me to come on board and write uh, the story of the LA riots and Brian Grazier, who's the partner of Ron Howard, just amazing partnership, you know, Apollo 13, a brilliant mind, you know, um, all the Da Vinci codes, just on and on. These guys are just great producers and producing directing team. They were going to produce this story, and we tried for 10 years um, to make this into a, a feature narrative, which is very hard because of all the things that made American crime hard. There were no real heroes in the, in the most literal sense. There were no real villains. It was very gray. It was not about answering questions. And we just tried and tried and tried. And, you know, no disrespect to Hollywood, but the metrics of it, just the, the financial metrics, did not allow for a movie that people felt they were comfortable making um, or could make at a particular price point. And I get it. I was not happy about that because I think it was a story worth telling. But I understand the difficulty. So um, while we were launching our third season of American Crime and while we were working on Gorilla, um, Lincoln Square Productions, which is a division of ABC News, which is part of ABC, which is where we work. We work for ABC. Um, they had sent an email to one of my um, representatives saying that they were, and they didn't know that I was trying to, had been trying to do this story for 10 years. And they sent an email to my representative and they said, well, it's the 25th anniversary and they wanted to do a, a little docu piece that was probably going to be about 45 minutes because it was going to air on ABC. So an hour on network television is really about 42 minutes of, 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 of real, uh, real estate, I call it. And my manager, you know, sent the email back saying, oh, John's too busy, he's not interested. And at that time, when I'm working, I get, you know, hundreds of emails. When I'm not working, I get no emails. I haven't had an email in about a, three months now. Um, but when I'm working, you get all these emails coming through. And, you know, you got to go through and answer the ones that are priority and the ones that don't, you know, they start to sink and sink and sink. And I saw this email, something in the LA riots, and ah, let me look at this. And it really, in a couple of days, had passed, a few days, and my agent said, no. And I got on, I said, no, I got to do this. I have to do this. So um, they made it happen. And, and the weekend, the first weekend of um, our first week of shooting of American Crime, we had already started shooting Gorilla, which was six episodes in London. And I had flown back. And I was going to direct the first episode back of American Crime. And it became very evident that my directing would only impede the quality of the show. So I had to drop out of that. But I came back so that I could be on the ground and do all the things hopefully a, a responsible producer would do. Because every year for American Crime, you know, it's like doing a pilot. It's not like most shows where, you, you know, you come back to the hospital or come back to the police precinct. New show, new season, new characters, new circumstances. But that, and I was back from London for about 11 days. And during that 11 days, I went out and started doing the interviews. Not me personally. Now, I, I personally, I did the interviews, but I wasn't alone. We had an amazing group of producers, journalists working. Because this was, this was the first documentary I ever did. And facts matter. Um, the truth matters. Um, people may think that alternative facts are OK. I, I don't believe that. Um, facts do matter. And, and you have to at least make an attempt to, to get it to have a, 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 be honorific of what really happened and other people's voices. This isn't about my opinion. If you're going to do a documentary, you've got to create a space where people feel comfortable telling their stories and then representing as many of those stories so the audience can walk away feeling that they have um, 
uh, and representative amount of information so they can draw their own conclusions. So, but American crime was shooting, guerrilla was shooting, and we started the documentary all in, all in that same week. And we did these interviews back to back to back. We had people flying in literally from Mexico. Some people no longer lived in the United States. They were spread out around the world. I did as many of the central interviews as I could over, you know, three or four days, you know, eight hours a day. Um, some of the journalists went off and did some more interviews, but it was all very simultaneous. And um, you were very kind. You said that I edited the footage. I did not edit the footage. We had a young editor named Colin Rich. So Colin was our assistant editor on American Crime for two years and brilliant young man. Every year um, we would do uh, sizzle reels like the one you saw. Um, that one Colin did not cut, but he would do ones like that so we could take it to the network and make them feel very comfortable. Don't worry, we're not going to waste your money. It's all going to be good. It's going to be brilliant. Colin would cut those. And I did a pilot last year. Colin cut the sizzle reel. He's amazing, brilliant young man, but never cut a He'd never done a full piece by himself. He's an assistant editor. Had never done, had gotten a full, complete solo editing credit previously. But I said, this guy's brilliant. We'll give him a shot. And we also had tried um, over the last year to take one more stab at doing a feature version of Let It Fall and Colin cut the reel that we went out to producers with. So this young man was cutting almost 24-7. And then I went back to London, so we were working almost 24 hours a day. We started this, so we, we started production on American Crime when in about September, and Let It Fall aired in March. So we started in September, ended in March. It was meant to be 42 minutes. That wasn't enough time. We went back to ABC. We need two hours on the air. They said, okay, we'll give you two hours. We, should, we cut it. We said, it's not enough time. We need as much time as we can get. And Disney, which owns all of these companies, said, cut the version you want, we'll give you a theatrical release. So the version that exists, the only version that exists now, we did do a version that aired on ABC, which I think is a very good, strong version, but the full version that exists now, the only one that exists is two hours and 28 minutes um, that was put together in just amazing, amazingly, um, focused amount of time, largely because of Colin's work, these producers, these journalists who were tireless, but, you know, 40, 45 interviews or so of people who just were willing to share their stories, and people from different communities who had been historically set up to distrust other communities. That's what we do. We pit people against each other. We tell people, well, you know, you, you should not like those folks. That's the history of us, very unfortunately, is people who can pitting other groups against each other. But these folks breaking down their barriers and willing to share their stories. Um, and, and let's face it, you know, people, um, how would anybody in this room feel 25 years later, people showed up and said, well, we want to take your story that nobody's talked about, or if they have talked about it, probably reoriented for their purposes. Um, journalists get beat up all the time now. We've, we've been taught to distrust mistrust the news. It's journalists' fault. So everybody, I don't care who you are, what you may believe, you have a reason to mistrust people showing up saying we want to tell your story. These people chose to trust these journalists. Um, and the result was, uh, you know, it's impossible for me to be objective, but I think it's a story that unfolds almost like no other story um, because it goes beyond what people think they know about that event or about our communities, how we interact, how we arrive to these moments. It's not one night. It's not one incident. Um, and seeing all the people who tried, the reason it's called Let It Fall is so many people tried to reorient what was going on. And so many other people, unfortunately, far more people were just, you know, let it fall. Who cares? Um, and that's the unfortunate thing. And people ask if it, this kind of thing can happen again. It absolutely can happen again. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen the same way. And whatever those issues are, um, they are metastasizing right now. They are forming right now. And people, you know, unfortunately, you have a night like this. It's wonderful to be here and to be, you know, in, in and among a group of people like this 
But there are moments where you realize, you know, you are pre preaching to the choir. Um, folks like yourselves, if you're here tonight, you know, you, you already have a capacity to want to know more, to want to do better, to want to try. There's a, oh, God, a brilliant little film uh, I saw with my wife, Beatrice at Dinner. Have to see it. Tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. I'm telling you, see it. Um, this is where social media does come in. I'm telling you, see that film, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. Well, thank you. I just, I know we're, we're running out of time, but what, what folks shared and how they shared their stories, um, it really was remarkable. And, and how it unfolds and how we see that connectivity is absolutely remarkable. So that, I, I have to be honest, if I never had the opportunity to be involved in another project, what, what people chose to share with us and with other people um, was really remarkable. And I do, and I really, I'm sincerely, I'm not, I, just so you get the name straight, I'm not involved with this other film at all, but Beatrice at Dinner is really a film, it's such a quiet, powerful film about, uh, again, about connectivity and responsibility, and the responsibility of people who can do better. Um, and all of us, you know, we, we all can, um, but some folks, you know, just getting through the day is so monumental that the other things in life, you know, it, it, it's not fair to expect everybody to, to give and do in the same way. So that film, Beatrice and Dinner, really, it, it, it reminds those of us who can in little ways and big ways of what we can do and just ama an amazing line of, you know, we can break things in an instant, but to fix things takes a lifetime. Uh, it's amazing. So I have no connection with it other than an emotional connection. I want to see it right now. Can I ask you something about narrative versus documentary? Yes. So in a narrative, you know the story you want to tell when you're writing, producing it, editing it, and you know why you're doing it. But with a documentary, you know the story, I, you, you know the world it's going to go in. But I imagine as a filmmaker, that as the story unfolds before you, it could possibly be surprising because in a way you're not steering the, yeah. the car, you know, you're a passenger, you're an observer, and is that true? And was anything surprising or did you learn or did it? Yeah, I mean, you can't obviously, you, you, well, I don't want to say you can't because people go into documentaries in different ways and, and you can't pretend that there's no um, objective or no bias at all. Um, obviously, when you, when you pick a subject matter, you, you have a rooting interest in it. You, you can't, you should not be making people say things or if somebody says something that doesn't align with your worldview intentionally, well, I'm going to cut that out or be great to take these two giant slices and put them together and make them say something. Um, but I would say with Let It Fall, because I knew that story for 10 years, I, I did know, I knew how I believed it would unfold, but you never know with people what their emotionality and what their engagement was going to be like. And certainly some people engaged in very different ways than I would have thought. But the, the surprising thing was just, again, for a lot of people, it wasn't 25 years ago. This was yesterday. You know, they were talking about loss like it was five minutes ago. Um, and that was the thing, to go into it, you know that story, you have a game plan, you know, if we're working on a set and it's not quite there, I know I can manage that or manipulate it in a million ways, but for these folks, um, there was very little that needed to be said to have them get to that space where they were sharing something that was very, both singular and universal. So the way it unfolds was the way that I hoped it would. Um, how I think the narrative sweeps over people was the way that I hoped it would, but it, it, it didn't, you, you don't have to manipulate real honest emotion, and you don't have to manipulate the connectivity that we all have. It's there, and I think I was very fortunate that this story happened to be as powerful as it turned out, but even if it wasn't the way people received it, um, I think folks, you know, if you have family, if you have friends, if you live in a community, you would have received it in the way that it, that it, it needed to be received. So I'm, I'm very thankful for this, and I know we're running out of time, so very thankful for all of you for choosing to um, join us this evening, and I hope that the rest of your festival is um, it's productive and, and you have a wonderful time. It's a beautiful space up here. So I want to say one us. final thing, which is I read uh, a definition of love 
that love is the willingness to enter into other people's stories. And you do that. And I hope for our industry and I hope for our world that you continue to enter into other people's stories with love.